I, I think uh, you have to be hopeful. Um, and that if you apply positive thinking to your life uh, and the, the, the idea of living more sustainably, you'll find that there are now lots of ways of doing that. Um, maybe more in developed countries as far as technology is concerned, but in developing countries often uh, they already are doing that uh, in the poorest communities. Uh, Hindu is a good example of, uh, of how she's living her life. Uh, so I think my attitude is always be positive, always believe that you can uh, you can change things yourself. Felix Dodds is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Felix has been a leading thinker in the area of global governance for 30 years. Now an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina, where he is the principal investigator for the Belmont Forum funded project, Governance of Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience for Sustainable Development. At UNC, he co-directed the 2014 and 2018 Nexus Conference on Water, Food, Energy, and Climate. He is secretary to the Government Friends of Governance for Sustainable Development Group in New York. He is also an international ambassador for the city of Bonn. He was the UK government candidate to be executive director of the United Nations Environment Program in 2019. In 2019, after a three year campaign, he succeeded in securing an annual UN General Assembly resolution on sustainable investment. In 2020, he was the Liberal Democratic candidate for the par parliamentary constitution uh, con constituency of mid Derbyshire. And I'm sure your accent is much better than, than mine on mid Derbyshire um, for the development of the sustainable development goals. He chaired the first UN conference on the come out with a set of indic uh, indicative SDGs in September, 2011. The conference, Sustainable Society's Responsible Citizens, occurred two months after Columbia first proposed the idea of the SDGs at a government retreat in Solo, Solo Indonesia in July of 2011. The UN had contra contracted Felix to write the background paper for that meeting on the options for reform of the UN in area of sustainable development. During the SDG negotiations in 2013 to 2015, he was the advisor to the Ford Foundation grantees on the SDGs and the co-founder of the coalition community, Communitas, that seconded it in lobbying for the SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. He was also the advisor for a number of other nonprofits during the SDG negotiations. I could go on and on, but I will wrap it up soon. He is set up and managed with SIWI and Water and Climate Coalition 2008 to 2012 at the UNFCCC was secured in three years water for the first time into the UN climate text. He has sat on a number of advisory boards, most recently for the UN Secretary General for the re review of the UN Global Compact for the President, UN Generally, General Assembly on Sustainable Finance, the German government's Global Conference on the Nexus, Water, Food, Energy, Renewable Energy, and Water. And he has authored over 20 books. The last one on stakeholder democracy, represented democracy in a time of fear. He also co-wrote co Negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals with Ambassador David Donahue and Jimania, the Viva Roche, and only one earth with the father of sustainable development, Maurice Strong. His new book, Tomorrow's People, The Impact of Disruptive Industries on Our Lives by 2030, will be out by July 2021. Felix, my God, that was a long bio, but it was well worth it because you've been doing this your whole life. This is, this is your thing. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. And I love it how um, Americans uh, pronounce mid 
how do you say it? Mid Mid Derbyshire. No, it's Mid Derbyshire. Mid Derbyshire. Okay. Uh, and it's always amusing because I actually think it's a better uh, it's a better way of saying it. it. Sounds more quaint and kind of English. Well, I, I appreciate you bearing with me with uh, slaughtering uh, uh, of your beautifully how you say it and it's so uh great to have you here so i'm i love your book and i've followed it since it came out and um i would recommend anybody who's passionate about the sustainable development goals who's passionate about how uh it evolved what what the story behind it is the depth the substance and and uh, a lot of diplomacy a lot of uh, uh a lot of meetings a lot of um rough negotiations and talks and, uh, and stuff. And that's really why I wanted to ask you on the show. So I want to take a deep dive dialogue with you and, and uh, not only let my listeners and uh, me get to know you a little bit better, but also get a little peek behind the scenes of what happened and transpired on your journey. And uh, if you don't mind uh, yeah. uh, sharing and sneaking with, with us, that would be so beautiful. Um, so first and foremost, this long biography that I went through and what you've done around sustainability, around uh, democracy, or more so diplomacy around the world. Um, you're from the United Kingdom, but you're, you're living in the United States now. Um, I've got to ask the question, has any of that helped to weather this pandemic and the craziness going on around the world? Have you... Have you had a little bit more resilience and how have you been? Have you weathered this okay? Can you give us an update and kind of tell us where you're at? Well, personally, I'm a diabetic. So I've stayed inside um, since we had the initial lockdown in March uh, earlier in this year. And it's been quite interesting. Most of my work is around intergovernmental meetings as you suggested. Um, some of those have moved um, virtual you can't do negotiations virtually. I mean, that uh, people seem to think that you can, but you can't because you have to build a trust with the uh, people that you're talking to, to be able to bridge the gaps that exist or to, to make advances. But a lot of the meetings that I, uh, I work at either uh, for the university or for any of my consultancies, uh, they've continued. And we've, we've, I've actually just this year birthed the new global coalition for working animals. So we've, we've used this time very productively uh, to move forward. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the UK has been in a bit of a mess as well. Uh, so you haven't addressed COVID particularly well, but nor did the UK. And so, um, you know, in a sense, it's kind of interesting seeing we have had a populist, or we have a populist leader, as you have had uh, here in the US, and they don't seem to understand how to deal with uh, such fundamental requirements of government to intervene uh, and uh, to give us the proper science. So you've been basically, you're telling me in lockdown, but you're you're doing okay? Are you excited at the outcomes of, of the election? Are you involved in any of that? Or are you still kind of... Uh participating in what's going on overseas or? So the UK had their election in December 2019. And the reason I stood for the Liberal Democrats at that time was I had gone to a briefing uh, in July by the UK government in um, New York. And I was very unimpressed with their preparations for the Glasgow climate meeting. And so I thought, well, what could I do? I mean, I, I've operated outside as a as a kind of non-government organization. So I decided to put myself forward for one of the political parties, the Liberal Democrats, on the basis that I could potentially chair the COP in Glasgow. My party was at that time on 20% in the opinion polls. And so we had hopes that we would form part of a coalition government. Uh, and then if you do that, there was a good chance that I might be asked either to be the Secretary of State for Environment or I might be uh, the minister. In either case, I would play a critical role in a Glasgow COP. That didn't happen. Uh, my party tanked uh, in the election. And so um, I find myself back at, uh, uh, in the United States. Uh, but in this case, the election went a good way. And I haven't been involved in the US election. I'm a green card holder, so I haven't engaged. Oh, in that. Okay, okay. Well, that, that's great. I'm glad 
Yeah, I'm glad you're doing well and, and um, glad you're um, uh, here today with us. And it's so nice to hear. The reason I kind of asked that, that leading question, uh, in case it's not clear, I speak to a lot of authors and futurists, people involved in activism, politics. They talk a lot about sustainability. They speak a lot about the future, but a lot, not a lot of them really apply it into their lives or they have applied it into their lives and they were able to weather this, this pandemic and all the other craziness going on in our world, not only climate change and biodiversity loss and, and um, Black Lives Matters, racism, whatever it is, to weather it pretty good and come, come through it resilient are also um, where a lot of things have bubbled to the surface or we've had some microscopes shown on a lot of problems, systemic problems that we have, which have really helped them to address solving those problems. And they've either written about it or done something active. And so that's kind of really why I wanted to ask you that question. So I'd like to, to make sure you're doing okay and you're still continuing this journey, this fight moving forward that we've got. We've still got, you know, the decade of action started off with a bang this year. It was fabulous the way we were going. And I said, we're going to place our feet firmly on this exponential roadmap to reach the goals and to get there. Uh, and then we were hit with all sorts of uh, things today, this year and it was pr pretty crazy. And so um, I wanna start out with the first question which will lead, lead us more into the SDGs and, and your book and some other uh, things. But do you consider yourself to be a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity or that we unify ourselves around this new alien called uh, biodiversity loss or climate change and try to fix this as a unified world with the UN and World Economic Forum Partnership, which was made, uh, uh, was it last year in the beginning of January, they sealed the deal. Um, can you kind of give us your insights or feelings on that thought process? Well, I'm going to take a step back and, uh, and comment on something you'd said, and then I'll move on to that. So Perfect. one of the things that um, I've tried to do with three books, and that was the only one I book with Maurice Strong um, from um, the, um, the negotiating the sustainable development goals and from Rio plus 20 to the new development agenda, which I did with Ambassador uh, Liz Thompson and Jorge Laguna is to try and let people understand what happened in the negotiations, these crucial negotiations, Stockholm, Rio, uh, Johannesburg, Rio plus 20 and the SDGs, but also to put it in the context of the real world. Too often we, we as um, environmentalists or sustainable development activists operate in a world which is our world and we don't look at the pressure that are coming on that world from outside. And so the books as part of what I call My Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, they, um, they try to, to show why the outcomes from the Stockholm Conference were not further implemented than they should have been. They show why the 92 conference where outcomes agenda 21, the climate agreement, the biodiversity did not find themselves more accelerated in implementation and the same for Rio plus 20 and for the, um, the SDGs. The great thing with the SDGs and the climate agreement in 2015, and if you add to that the Sendai agreement on disaster relief and the financing for development process, is they gave us a complete narrative. And before, in a sense, uh, the elections uh, um, in the UK and uh, in Brazil and in um, uh, the US, we were able to start to see that, in a sense, move down to the bureau bureaucratic implementation of that. And the SDG process, and we'll come to that later, has been one of the most successful as far as getting a deep dive into, uh, into different stakeholder groups compared to any of the previous uh, agreements. So I think that that's, that's important to understand. And I think that in the context of, uh, of where we are now, um, it's not surprising that um, when you've had four years of, uh, of political, um, I guess, um, uh, inaction in the United States uh, by the government, 
that uh, others would pick up the, the weight. And so you've seen this coalition of the willing in the United States on climate change to deliver the, the, the climate agreement irrespective of whether uh, the United States government does it. So I think it's kind of generated some interesting things. And I think that it's very difficult for most people to understand how these intergovernmental negotiations go. Uh, you know, but my, my belief is basically most people want to make the right decisions. They have their national interests and those national interests um, play a role that you have to negotiate around. And those national interests, sometimes you can get them to set aside, and this is the building of trust between different governments uh, and between other stakeholders and governments, for them to take off their national interests and to be able to move to, a, uh, to something which is better for the planet. And you see those points in history where that's happened and that I've mentioned them. I don't see that we are mature enough for a global society. And I write about that in the Stakeholder Democracy book. I argue that we're in this arc of history which is moving from representative to participatory democracy. And we've just, uh, if you haven't seen it, your, uh, your listeners, they should watch the Chicago 7 about Tom Hayden and Abby Hoffman. They played a critical role in the 60s in trying to move forward the participatory democracy agenda through the Port Heron Statement and then are uh, going down into places like Chicago and housing estates and trying to make that approach real. But with the situation we find ourselves in now where we have fake news, we have um, all these very destructive processes going. There is no way that we will be able to create a global, um, in a sense, non-nation based process. And I really don't think we're mature enough as a species yet to do that. So what I argue in the book is that we need to strengthen government's ability to take difficult decisions on climate change or biodiversity. And you do that by engaging the stakeholders as a support mechanism so that those populistic um, viewpoints portrayed by some on the right about not doing these things and they're not, they're not science or that they don't believe them can be, in a sense, um, uh, challenged by other big players in society, whether that's the media or whether that's industry or whether that's NGOs or women's groups or youth groups. I kind of want to pry a little bit more into the, the person who is you and, and uh, you get even more a better glimpse behind uh, who you are and you kind of hinted at it. I, I've seen you in the halls at, at several climate conferences before uh, in, in different, different areas uh, of the UN, but you always uh, wear these long ties with a Marvel hero, superhero, something cartoony, but you just hinted to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, and so I think there's some kind of, you know, superhero Marvel um, uh, uh, thing in your background, which, which uh, I think plays into your personality. You're very, uh, 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 very good diplomat, but also very personal. Is there any insights there of, 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 of why that thinking of, of this bigger galaxy thinking of our world that ties into who you are and, and, and that, that you can maybe enlighten us a little bit? I think, um, and I'm not by any means the only person, my, my, my father used to move, uh, my, my parents, we used to move every two years um, uh, because he worked for Rolls-Royce in the personnel department. He would set up different factories for Rolls-Royce. So I've lived in Scotland, I've lived in uh, Northern Ireland. I was in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. I was the only Catholic at an old Protestant school. And I remember as a 10 year old being taken into the headmaster's office to be told, never tell anyone here that you're a Catholic. And the only reason I was allowed at the school was because my father was, uh, was helping to set up the factory there. And these things influence you. And then as a, as a 16 year old, I hitched to Greece. As an 18 year old, I went overland to Thailand. When I got married, we took a, a year off for our honeymoon and traveled down the Nile, and I ended up teaching in, uh, in Khartoum at the, at the international school. That gets you a different perspective um, of the world and the people, and, you know, and I love interacting with people. I mean, it's all about those connections. And I think if you're positive, uh, you can often draw people up and get them to do things that they, perhaps they didn't believe that they could do when they arrived. Yeah, and I almost, I almost see that as a, a difference than democracy. I almost see it as diplomacy. It's this good 
inner relations, how do you uh, talk about difficult subjects with people of all different cultures and walks of life, but find the dip diplomatic way to do that, to still come to an agreement for the good of all. And uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, I really appreciate that. There are some things that you've done in the past that uh, before we get too much down the road of the SDGs that I, I really uh, I like and I wanted to touch and maybe discuss with you. So you've been on a couple times on the Nexus for Water, Food and Energy. I, I'm writing a book, it comes out the end of this year, it's called Menu B, People and Planet Food Saving Solutions. Um, it's all based around you know global food reform and this new UN Food System Summit that came out this year and we'll hopefully find in a physical meeting uh, next year. Um, but it ties a lot to this nexus, it ties a lot to solving, as Paul Hawken talks about in his book, Drawdown, a lot of the global problems, human health, uh, hunger, poverty, malnutrition, obesity, but also environmental and ecological destruct uh, being wreaked by, by food. And so I, I really, my, my eyes and, and my heart lit up when I saw that you've been involved in that over the years and uh, we've seen you in different different events, uh, doing stuff in those areas or, or writing. Um, and I also follow your blog and I'm, I'm gonna, in the show notes, I'm gonna make sure that all my listeners have your website and your blog and can follow all the interesting thing. I've been receiving your, your, your newsletter in my in inbox for years now. And I, re I really appreciate your, uh, your way of writing and educating and helping us on this transition that we need to go. Um, can you maybe depart your thoughts, your feelings, your your views towards how global food reform, fixing our food problems uh, and impacts on the environment can really address not only numerous SDGs, but also uh, solve a lot of the environmental problems and the transitions that we need to, we need to make in this world? Your maybe thoughts, feelings, or work that you've done, I would love to hear some of that um, before we go so on. Yeah, so a couple of things there. I mean, um, the, I mean, the different one of the key differences between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals was the Millennium Development Goals dealt with sectors. And so the eight uh, different goals dealt with poverty, education. There was no discussion about the interlinkages. The German government made the decision to host the Nexus conference in 2011. It had been um, due to a meeting they'd held at the Stockholm Water Week two years earlier, asking what their contribution to Rio plus 20 should be. Uh, and it, the conference was very important because it, it started a conversation in the run-up to Rio plus 20 about those interlinkages. We found that, for example, that um, the projections by the Stockholm uh, Environment Institute was that by 2030, due to population growth, great to urbanization, particularly in places like China and India, uh, 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 climate change, that we would fall short uh, on energy by about 40%, that we'd need another 30 to 50% of food, which goes partly to your issue, but that we'd have a shortfall of water of 40%. Um, now that would happen in different places in the world. And so that created a conversation with, which ultimately had uh, two conferences in uh, U uh, at the University of North Carolina in 14 and 18. And in 14, the governments came down to North Carolina and they started to understand that if they were going to set some targets uh, during the uh, open working group negotiations, those targets where possible should link together the issues around um, the three, three areas we discussed, uh, food, water and energy. Uh, we put climate in because it had such a, an additional impact on even those targets that were being, uh, those um, uh, figures of demand that were being suggested we would have by 2030. Um, so th that's, in a sense, part of why you'll find in the, in the food SDG and in the water SDU, some of the targets and particularly the indicators linked together. You won't in the energy one. So we need to look at this as, as a more joined up thinking and I think yeah so I'm not answering your question straight away I'm kind of trying to give you a back back that's thought. fine perfect um also at the same time and you will remember this there was the um the Johan uh, Rockstrom, yeah, Johann Rockstrom. Planetary, 
uh, boundaries from, I think, that he, I think he was still at the Stockholm Environment uh, Institute, went to the Stockholm Resilient Institute. Very important in the, in the discussions around the corridors for Rio Plus 20. Then we had the enormously brilliant work by Kate Rawworth, who basically, um, she's from Oxfam, she invented the Oxfam uh, donut. And what she did was, and I think it was quite important, is um, she knew that the planetary boundaries was not an easy discussion for develop, uh, developing countries because developed countries had used all their resources and basically used that as their form of development. So to tell uh, developing countries, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we've used it all, and you can't use them, was not going to be a constructive conversation. It wouldn't go anywhere. And so she... Um, uh, she uh, looked through all the government submissions from Rio Plus 20 and worked out which of those were the key, uh, the key issues that were being addressed. And that became the social foundation for her uh, donor. So she played back to governments what they had said themselves. And that made the discussion about what the safe and just space for humanity, the, the bit of the donut which we were meant to live in, to be a lot more of a constructive conversation. And so I think if you look at those two different, um, I guess, conversations that were happening as we went into Rio Plus 20, they played a critical role in then the development of the SDGs, but also in a sense uh, to expand those people who had previously been very much focusing on one area, whether it was food, energy, or water and to get them to start to engage those uh, other areas. Now, you have to understand that the Food Summit next year is not a, a UN summit. It's a Secretary General Summit, which means that it's not a negotiation. I mean, they may negotiate something, but it's not, it's not like uh, Rio Plus 20. It's not like the SDGs. It's not like um, um, the 92 conference. It's a Secretary General initiative. And so it's very loose in the context of what can come out of it. And, and that may be the best thing because it allows more air around it for constructive ideas. And what they're hoping to do is to get a lot more commitments for organizations to do particular things. My problem with the commitment approach is that we don't have yet, and we haven't had it for the SDGs and we don't have it for other processes, a proper way of evaluating those commitments to see what their impact is. And so it's become this thousand flowers bloom approach where maybe 990 will die. So we need to develop a much more coherent way of measuring the impact. And not all of them are, you know, uh, say how many people will get water because some of them are data collection, some of them are capacity building, but you need to give those you need to work out what their contributions are and have a way not only of um, evaluating, uh, evaluating their contribution so, and helping them if they need it, but also where those the glue bits, the capacity building or the data collection stuff that you need, uh, where that can also be given a very high recognition as fundamental to actually being able to deliver as well. Well, I really I like that insight, and I thank you for sharing that with us and getting us a little deeper into the food and, and dissecting that. You know, Johan Rockstrom, you're right, the uh, Stockholm Resilience Institute, and now he's uh, uh, at the Potsdam Institute of uh, Climate Change in, in Berlin, and um, he, he does many other things. So also the EAT Forum, the EAT Foundation, which uh, did the EAT Lancet report that came out uh, last year as well, which uh, there's a lot of movement around that. and. Uh, Gunhild Stordalen, who's a part of the EAT Foundation, has also jumped in on this uh, uh, UN Food uh, uh, System Summit, and and you know there's some momentum around there. It's nice to finally have a voice, even though it is the Secretary General's uh, type of initiative. Um, some some real dialogue occurring more around food, which hasn't always been as strong as it probably should be, as, as specifically and the bigger picture of global food reform and systems, uh, food systems. We kind of tend to, to break it down into silos and aspects of, of that. And then what you mentioned about Kate as well, so the donut economics and, and stuff and things that, some actual practice and actions to get us into the safe operating space of planetary boundaries, things that are going on in the Netherlands that she's doing and, and other places around the world. I'd love to see that move, movement and, and uh, 
appreciate you uh, clearing that up for us and kind of making that a little bit more understandable. One thing that has, um, has come out just in that is, uh, is a question as we kind of transition into the SDGs. Obviously, for those of the listeners who aren't aware, before the Sustainable Development Goals was, was the Millennium Development Goals, which you touched upon. Um, now we have, um, since 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals. Um, and, um, and hopefully maybe we could tickle what, what, what may come after that. I, I have uh, a little bit of insights and have heard a lot of discussions and things uh, about the, the future roadmap and plan. And so I'd like to maybe spring some of that off of you as well. Um, but really, my, my first question is, all this involvement that you've had, all this background, all this progress and working up before and, and leading into the sustainable development goals. And actually, I, I tell people it's, it's a historical precedence. It's like the world's first ever global moonshot. It's the first time the world has unified itself around a common roadmap, a plan, a goal, uh, something to work towards to 2030 in 193 countries, uh, uh, you know, agreed and uh, decided on that. But when you look at back at it now, or kind of the, the armchair captain, uh, armchair quarterback type of a thing, and you look at the SDGs, do you think we presented them to the world, to society, the way they should have been? Did we explain them good enough? Do you think the general aptitude and understanding even today is good enough on the SDGs? What are your thoughts or feelings on how we launched them and, and what the progress has been you know, five years into it now. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to get to that, but I'm going to give you an arc of uh, how they came about. Please. So uh, the the important thing uh, perhaps is to go back to President Mbeki from South Africa's speech in 2006 to the General Assembly. And he was commenting as the host country president for the Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002. And he said, Sustainable development is dead. Um, <clears throat> the Doha round of trade negotiations had, had failed and we're basically, you know, it's a disaster. And it was then that President Lula of Brazil picked up the, the baton. And in 2007 at the General Assembly, he then addressed the General Assembly and said, well, okay, well, we better do something about it. And so what we had was developing country leadership. This is the first time I would argue the developing country, uh, countries took the lead in the, in the sustainable development world and actually pushed the agenda. So he said, we're gonna have a Rio plus 20 and we'll host it in Brazil. It was then left to uh, Maria Velotti, who was then the ambassador, now the chief of staff uh, for the secretary general to take forward that idea and to work with it. I, I worked with her, we hosted uh, my former organization, Stakeholder Forum, we hosted in, uh, November 2008, a retreat for member states in San Sebastian that came out with the Donostia Declaration, which identified which ultimately would be the four uh, themes uh, or the four main areas for uh, Rio Plus 20, which was looking at the institutions, green economy, emerging issues, and a review of what we had achieved. <clears throat> then in the process of moving forward, um, the negotiations didn't agree in 2008 for the summit, they left it to 2009. We worked with the Obama transition team and with other European countries to get them on board because they were not keen. Um, then we had Copenhagen and it was, uh, as we thought then, a disaster. I, I would argue now in retrospect there was something very important or two important things that came out of that. The member states then were stuck at Copenhagen airport for a number of uh, hours, if not days in certain cases, because of the snow. They then went back to New York and on the 24th of uh, December, 2009, after having failed in Copenhagen, or at least that was the viewpoint, decided to have a new summit on sustainable development. So under you know, disastrous backdrop and you know, still in the economic crisis that we were in, they took the step and that was a huge leadership, um, I think pushed very much by developing countries because once Brazil were on board, South Africa and other key ones came on behind them. We then were in the process of having agreed a summit. Then there was a, you know, an, a preparatory process. 
And as you mentioned in my introduction, I did the background paper for the solo member state retreat in Indonesia, where Paolo Cabrera from Colombia and uh, Guat supported by Guatemala and Peru stood up and said, well, we need some sustainable development goals. Um, huge leadership. Uh, the development world, whether it was um, USAID or whether it was DFID or whether it was Oxfam or Save the Children Fund uh, or any of the development NGOs were against it at the beginning. They saw it, uh, they wanted an MDG plus and that wasn't what we needed because the MDGs only deal with developing countries and we needed some type of roadmap that dealt with every country. And so then there was a huge process uh, around Rio plus 20 to popularize it. There, were, there was, a, a, if you take the whole art, there were two secretary general reports. There were two high level panels that uh, promoted it. There were over a hundred national meetings. There was something like 10 million people voting on which issue they thought should be part of the agenda. Uh, there were then uh, 13, meetings of this open working group. And I'm, 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 I know I'm kind of going into the- No, the, please do. I want to hear it. We want to go deep. Well, so, so one of the outcomes from Rio Plus 20 was that there will be set up something for financing for development because they recognized they needed to finance whatever new goals were going to happen. And then secondly, they said there will be a working group made up of 30 countries. And it was given to Brazil, Maria Velotti again, a huge leadership role she played to then negotiate with member states after Rio plus 20 to, um, to get 30 countries. Well, at the end of uh, December uh, 2012, there were still 70 countries who wanted those 30 seats. And so in the end, she came up with this brilliant idea of buddying up. So you couldn't have a seat to yourself. You had to share it with someone. And so you have some bizarre combinations. You have the United States, I think, Israel and Canada, you have Australia, the UK, and the Netherlands. I think you actually had something like Malta, China, and someone. Uh, I mean, so some of them were very bizarre. Uh, and that you should only speak for the group of countries. So it broke down the traditional blocks of the European Union and the group of 77 um, into smaller, very different types of conversations. And that uh, then fed into the 13 open working group meetings and it created a complete different dynamics and because we were working on the what I call the sustainable development uh, arc as opposed to the development arc the engagement of stakeholders was different the development arc tended to be civil societies so everybody was thrown into one part and you missed key groups like indigenous peoples or not civil society, local government, trade unions aren't. And so it's an, a reductionist theory. Uh, the nine chapters of Agenda 21 from 92 gave spaces for women and for youth. Young people should have their own space. And so that was the, the, the backdrop for there to be nine seats or more than nine seats in the, in the end for individual stakeholders to participate. So the most participatory process. If you wanted to engage um, and if you had any interest, you would know that this was going on because it was huge. You had a chance to have a voice. So in the sense, the SDGs became this joint document that we all owned by the end. None of us got what we wanted. We all had to compromise, whether it was stakeholder groups or whether it was governments, but we all ended up at the end with something which we felt was really important. And that was why it wasn't renegotiated when we went to the formal negotiations, which were the following year, where we had eight intergovernmental negotiations for the 2030 agenda. It was decided that that process would not reopen, even though in theory it had only been 70 countries. And so the 2030 agenda, the text around it, which is more the visionary stuff and the, and the governance stuff, uh, was the stuff we negotiated um, it, uh, at, uh, in 2015. But it was a huge... Um, way of moving forward now let's look at where we are so you know one of the problems and i i i, I voiced this during the finance to development process which was parallel to the sdgs and ended up with the addis ababa action agenda um i argued that there were two things that needed to happen there neither of which i succeeded in getting one was that the uh, addis agreement needed to also 
look at each of the SDGs and look at the specific funding that is needed for those. So there are certain ones like global, that are global uh, goods like education and health, which the kind of funding that you would want would be different. And then I argue that you should look at it on the levels of development. So there should be packages for LLDCs uh, or least developed countries or medium developed countries. Those will be different packages that you will be looking for, different combinations of public or aid uh, support or trade support or, or different elements of finance. Now that didn't happen, which was a shame. It, get, it, got, it got the process further, but it would have been a much stronger outcome uh, if we'd been able to align the financial agreements with that. And one of the problems we had, and we'd had this after Joe Berg, and this is what I approached the government. I was going like, dudes, you need to think about your budget in 2015. If the SDGs are agreed, there needs to be money released in 15 so that we can have action in 16. Uh, or at least the money arrives in 16 and we have action by 17. The governments didn't do that. And so, and the reason for that is that they hadn't, we hadn't negotiated, it wasn't a final agreement. And so uh, the, the aid budgets, just to look at the aid budgets, in predominantly didn't factor the SDGs in till 16, which meant that money didn't really arrive till 17, which meant that action didn't take till 18. And what happened on the UN side? Well, the UN has a thing called the Fifth Committee, which negotiates the budget. The budget uh, in October uh, 2015 for the UN system to work on SDGs was zero. And it was zero because governments had not agreed when they started the negotiations that, the, that there should be money put aside. And the Americans played a critical role in saying, no, we can't agree on money for something that may or may not happen. And um, I, if you've read my blog, you saw that I led some of the opposition to that. And we got the fifth committee to overturn that decision and ultimately to get money in, P in UN agencies and uh, in uh, UN desert in 16 to be able to do this. So just the infrastructure of funds in the, in the sense in the aid world was hampered. It takes time to go in. But then the other things happened, which I thought was really good. You have, and you may have seen it, SDGfunders.org. SDGfunders.org is pretty much any foundation that's working on sustainable development goals now reports on which goal, which target, which country they're doing. And so you can go, if you're living in Ghana, there's actually a platform in Ghana for all the foundations working on the SDGs. The same is true in Indonesia. There's a platform now for foundations um, for the Arab region because it was controversial to do it through the individual ones because it meant that the government's position on NGOs came into play by doing it in the region. So a huge amount of stuff has gone on as far as the foundations that never happened uh, before. I mean, they never did this. And so this is a, a very important um, movement. If you look at industry, you'll find industry very well aware of the SDGs. And if you go to the Global Compact website, you'll find a number of uh, things that can help your company to be able to integrate the SDGs. The Global Reporting Initiative is also supporting that with in a sense, <coughs> uh, the reporting um, of that. And then if you look at the more broader thing, there are now principles uh, for responsible investment, which existed before, but are now part of that ecosystem. There are principles for responsible banking, banking la launched in 2019, principles for responsible insurance, You've now got principles for green bonds, principles for SDG bonds. The UN Economic Commission for Europe have created other principles for public-private partnerships so that they may be judged whether they're helping to deliver SDGs or not. So the ecosystem uh, for finance is starting to move in, in an interesting way. And if you look at the finance, for the capital market, something like 45 companies control 60 to 65 percent of the money going through the capital markets and if you change the rewards between the different elements of the capital market then you are able to change in a sense a huge amount so that those discussions are all going on in a way again that never happened before one of my criticisms is that too often the ngos have just repackaged their sectoral policies around the sdgs and said oh yes look we're doing food or we're doing Water. They've not understood what's underneath the whole ethos of the SDGs, which is the, uh, for me, the, the interlinkage between them.
that they're, that they're truly all interlinked. They are a system, they're targets, indicators, they're very much done. I mean, as um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs says so eloquently um, with backcasting um, uh, um, from 2030 to present, and, and there's a lot more behind the scenes that each individual, there's two things that I would like to touch upon um, and, and, and I don't I don't necessarily want us to go back there, but I want to touch with some parallels or some things that are interesting. So you, you mentioned that really um, uh, Brazil was a key player, had some key players in there and in starting this initial initial movement. And then there's a few other things that happened along the way. Last year, 2019, actually, we were supposed to have the climate conference in, in uh, Rio again or in Brazil. Then it was switched to Santiago, Chile. Then it was canceled there and then held in Madrid. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting to see how the leadership has switched, how political things have come in there. And then, okay, we're not gonna host it here anymore. Uh, there was also a lot of controversy around uh, the, uh, the Amazon burning and, and political things around that as well. But it's interesting how how that those placements of, of movements and, and leadership kind of shifts and changes, as well as you know initially the U.S. was in the Paris Agreement and and on board, and then they weren't, and now hopefully we're it looks like if everything goes well with Biden, um, that we'll be back in and 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 um, we'll really be like I said at the beginning of the year on this exponential roadmap. Um, to place our feet firmly in there and, and to achieve it. That's one thing that in this whole process that a lot of people aren't seeing is that there's this exponential function. If we get that critical mass and enough people on board of countries and nations and moving in the right direction, that that exponential function really grows fast and we, we can make the goals and the targets. It, it is an exponential roadmap though. And so um, I just thought it was really neat, the parallels, uh, um, of how, how you and how it's kind of gone back and forth and there's good and bad and, and it kind of plays. You know, at, at the Paris Agreement, you know, there was Christiana Figueres as the, the queen of the cop and, and many other influential people that were Ban Ki-moon at the moment of, of some of the decision-making around September and also uh, at the Paris Agreement that, that kind of made that shift. And I, it's always nice to hear that backstory, that real depth, because it just wasn't, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. This is long, tedious, but there is an infrastructure, there is a system, there is a thinking and pillars and foundation, a sustainable foundation behind that to move us forward. Still, with all that having be, been said, could I ha have you take a, a, a a, a microscopic view of maybe for the general public uh, at, at the Paris Agreement or the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals 2015, so whether it's September or the Paris Agreement, you know, there was tumult, that was a tumultuous time for right before the climate conference as well. Um, how to today, as an advocate for the SDGs, a, a lot of the time, I'm confronted, people don't have a clue. They've never heard of them before. And they're like, uh, oh yeah, I like number one red. It's my favorite color. That's the one I'm working on, no poverty uh, or, or, or things like that. You know, um, did, did, we, did we bottom up reach everybody uh, the proper way? Is there any, any things or inside? Like if you had to do it over again, or if you're looking back, what would you wish we had done differently or many in, in, insights in that initial launch of, of the SDGs? So a couple of things. One is, um, and I'm going to go back on some of the things you said. The, the book I'm doing for 22 uh, is based on JFK's Profiles and Courage. And we're going to look at uh, eight negotiations and you mentioned Christina Figaro. She will be one of the Profiles and Courage. Paolo Cabrera for the SDGs. And we'll try and look at them as individuals, as people, you know, what was their motivation? Why did they manage to stand out? Because I think understanding those people uh, is very important. They play critical roles. People play critical roles uh, when you get successes. And the same is true 
when you get failures. There are particular reasons why you end up where you do um, because of, uh, uh, you know, because of the, the wrong people being there and the, the, the lack of trust. And one of the great things about, I would say, the trust issue was without Rio plus 20, we would never have got the SDGs. Um, and nearly all of the negotiation, negotiators stayed from Rio plus 20 through the SDGs. They may have left by the 2030 agenda negotiation for 15, but the core group of people who had built the trust over four years uh, or five years in certain cases were the same people and they were able to help move that. And then you had people like Paolo or you had um, uh, people like Kamal, who, Ambassador Kamal, who was co-chairing with Ambassador Carosi, the SDGs. And perhaps Ambassador Carosi doesn't get as much credit um, as Ambassador Corral, as Ambassador uh, Kamal, uh, because he didn't stay for the final year. It was handed over to Ambassador Donahue. But these people, the way that they link things, or, you know, we were at one point going to be thrown out. Some NGO had gone down onto the floor of negotiations and insulted um, Iran. I think it was Iran, really nastily and whatever. And so they called for all stakeholders to be kicked out. And so um, I happen to be in the coffee bar, as I'm always. Um, and so I'd, I'd walked in the net after it had happened. Um, and the next session, Ambassador Kamal came up because some stakeholders came in and the police were trying to, you know, the, the UN police were trying to move us. And he just said, no, no, leave them, leave them. And he, he used his, his, in a sense, um, the way that people trusted him to show, no, I want these people to stay. There was no discussion. But those, those moments play critical roles in it. Now, the other thing I would just add on um, the implementation, one of the very interesting reports that people are worth looking back at, it's a report by Nick Robbins, uh, who ultimately co-chaired the, um, the UNEP uh, finance uh, report a couple of years ago. But he was at that time at HSBC. And he, or HSBC, did a review of the recovery packages to see how green the recovery packages from 2008 were. And so um, the Republic of Korea were like 78% uh, of their recovery package was on green. So they were looking to get um, you know, renewables and everything there. China was uh, actually the second at 37%. The EU money was at just about 50, I think. The US, Germany, uh, Spain were about 20. And so that played an important role in putting money behind green technology, which we're seeing the results of now. And it's very crucial that whatever we do uh, now for the recovery packages also takes the same, uh, same approach. What could we have done differently? I don't think that we could have done. I think it was the most engaged that we could have been. I, I, can't, I, I think you know, it, was, it, it was a shame that some of the development NGOs literally didn't come on till the last meeting of the OWG. I think Save the Children Fund was still trying to, at the G7 in 2014, get the SDGs kicked out and have the NDGs. So there was internal pressures from the development uh, mafia to not take that role. It would have been better if we could have persuaded them earlier to come on. But my daughter was on a train in Indonesia uh, two years ago uh, to the airport, and they were running SDG videos on the train for you to watch. So I think you have to look at where you are. We're in the, I think we're both in the United States. It's unlikely uh, that, that, that it will be promoted greatly in the United States because they've already experienced the right-wing attack on Agenda 21 uh, before. There would have to be a, a different approach in the US than there are in other countries. Uh, but I do think you've got the localization of SDGs going on where you try and get local councils to take it up um, with their thing. You've got subnational governments taking it up. Um, that, so I think there's a whole lot of ways that that's happening. I had advocated, and though they liked the idea, they didn't enact it. My argument was in the run up to the, um, the heads of state review in 19 and leading into what was going to be the Glasgow meeting in 20. I put forward a paper to, uh, to the Secretary General's office arguing we should have a 17 month campaign and that each month there should be a month on each of the SDGs, which would recognize the, the communities around that and that we would take climate as a cross-cutting issue so it would lead into a, 
uh, a run up to Glasgow in a way that uh, it brought everybody together. Uh, they didn't decide to do that. Uh, it's a mistake, I think, because I think we could have energized those communities and use that as an opportunity for further commitments from that community, whether it was education or whether it was water community or whether it was um, the energy community. But we could also have used it as a way of educating on what the SDGs are. They're not just about your sector, they're about the interlinkages. Anyway, uh, that's my beef. They should have taken it up. I'm not saying I'm always right, but I think I was right in that. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And that, I mean, you know, there there is no right or wrong answer, so to say. I think that. Um, um, uh, but it's nice to get your perspective. So uh, you you will be participating in Glasgow next year and, and, and be there regardless or or, or um, because you didn't do that position, you're not going to go or? So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, it's my consultancies that I now fund my activities. So I have this work on uh, um, disaster relief and, um, and uh, <laughs> governance. We will probably go to... Uh, at least go to the bond meeting. Glasgow is the end thing. Um, it's not the most yeah, important. Yeah. Uh, the important things are the parish yeah. meeting and the bond. Um, I'm working um, uh, with uh, a think tank on travel and tourism. Um, I've been trying to get some a little bit of work done on looking at um, household waste to fuel, air fuel. Uh, there's evidence to show that it's a 70% reduction in CO2 emissions. You can use this present uh, engines. There's a pilot being done with Shell and British Airways at the moment. Uh, and I think also United have done it uh, at a, out of somewhere, uh, one of their hubs. They've actually been collecting domestic waste. So it's a win-win. You don't landfill and you actually reduce your carbon emissions. So I'd like to see more work on that if I manage to persuade the, Malta, the government of Malta who run the think tank to do that, we might do it. And then Very I've nice. got a little bit of work on finance, um, private sector finance. So it'll depend on what my particular particular issues are, whether I go. I'm not going to. I'm not going for the sake of going. Yeah, yeah I have yeah. a reason to do it. Yeah, I, I I'm actually in Hamburg, Germany, and I actually work uh, out of the Bonn office and do a lot of work with the UNF Triple C, uh, and then also with Resilience Frontiers, and so. Um, I do want to get a, a little bit more, tickle a little bit more into the depths of the SDGs, but I, I already alluded to the fact that, you know, what, what could there, should there, will there be something after 2030? Uh, and right now, last year in Songdo, Korea, at the NAP Expo, um, uh, we, uh, the National Aptet Adaptation Program uh, uh, Expo, meeting in Songdo, Korea last year with Ban Ki-moon and, and uh, uh, numerous delegates and um, uh, different uh, non-party delegates. We um, had a uh, what was called Resilient Frontiers, a workshop which could be the progress of maybe moving front forward and, and, and a resilience development goals or a next plan, a roadmap, whether it gets that far, we don't know. But that started in Songdo, Korea. It was a five-day moonshot workshop, kind of thinking, backcasting, using system dynamic modeling, having delegates and players discuss that. Um, and it was turned over um, to the interagencies right before um, the, the COP in, in, um, in Madrid. And then at Madrid, at the, uh, at the COP25, they actually had the um, resiliency lab that they launched. Um, um, and so it, it's progressing along and whether it will will make it that far, but it, it's on the right road. And the, the thinking behind it is resilience frontiers, these frontier emerging technologies that, so if we reach the sustainable development goals, we should have a solid infrastructure, a nice base to springboard off into some resilience for our future that we really need to kind of bring some stability globally into our world with using these pioneering technologies, but also uh, including and, and where maybe the SDGs or others left off, we, we've really tried to include indigenous populations. So we have uh, Hindu Ibrahim, uh, uh, Hindu Omar Ibrahim on, on the board as well as she's also an SDG advocate and so on. 
So um, it's really interesting um, the progress on that. But I, I, I uh, you know, I don't know if you've been involved, what your thoughts or feelings on that afterwards. But I really also think that we could go into maybe uh, the first big burning question that I have for you. And that is uh, the burning question WTF. And no, it's not the, the swear word. It's actually, Felix, what is the future? What is the future? So uh, people, when I ask them this, they don't automatically, to my surprise, say, well, it's the Paris Agreement. It's the Sustainable Development Goals. That's the plan and roadmap for the future. And every answer is different. And so I want to know from you, just personally, in your life and situation, what's the future? For me? Or yeah. for the... Well, for, first, I'll make a comment on, on the, the, the general stuff. I mean, the reason right, why right. I'm the, the 2030 uh, book uh, that you talked about um, is I've been playing around with this agenda of the new technologies since during the 2014 negotiation. And there's a very good um, division of the, um, uh, the Canadian government called, uh, what's it called? Uh, wait a second. Uh, I've, I've got in there, yes, I have. Yes, you're right. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's called um, Peter Pathway. Canada. It's called, uh, um, oh yeah, Policy Horizons, the Canadian Policy Horizons team. Yes, yeah. They're doing some really interesting work. And we tried in 14 to persuade the Canadian government to fund them to come and take away, which is what you did, a number of the key negotiators and get them to imagine over a weekend what the world would look like if they did that. And that's one of my, you going back to what did I think we've, Failed to do that would be the one yeah. thing that I would have argued yeah. that if we'd done that, it would have helped a lot to envisage the the uh, the kind of coherence of the uh, of what we were trying to do. Um, I do think that the new technologies and my new book looks at ten of the different technologies, um, and then unlike um, all the other future books that I at least I've read, we're trying to make it accessible to the general public. So you will read the home life; it'll be. You know, you walk into your house, what will your house look like? What will your kitchen look like? What will your bathroom look like? You know, what will your shower do? I mean, uh, you can already get um, a shower head. I've, you find these things out when you do the research. A shower head where you can Bluetooth your favorite songs for singing in the shower. Um, and so, you know, we'll do the same. For, we've done the same for travel. We're looking at social life, looking at entertainment, just trying to make it such that people can understand these changes and, and then we're going to use a family afterwards going back through the chapters to ask the questions the policy questions what does this mean about privacy what does this mean about whatever you know uh, climate change or, or whatever and we'll integrate the SDGs and climate through it and I think that the 2050 agenda it'll be a 20 2050 it'll be a 20 year one you can see that the cbd is going down a 2050 uh path i think everybody will so whatever's agreed post 2030 will be a 2050 horizon um i think that then what we're looking at um is um some form of what we're dealing with as you were saying at the moment many of the challenges and then what roles those new technologies play in helping to deliver that and so i think the design of the um, outcome document needs to be different. I actually think it needs to be closer to the Agenda 21 chapters, where you have, in a sense, the, the goal at the top, the targets, and then you go through the different mechanisms, whether it's technology, whether it's capacity building, whether it's finance, uh, whether it's education, whether it's um, whatever, that need to be part of that to help you deliver that. And you'll, you'll notice the A and Bs in the... Um, SDGs, and that's my fault. I had tried all along to get the the um, G77 advocate for that kind of agenda. What I wanted under each of the goals was, in a sense, what are your delivery mechanisms for doing it? And so that those could be judged as well. And so the A and Bs and Cs in there are in a sense uh, how far we got in that conversation it wasn't as integrated i wanted it to be in a sense common as common as you could across the the different sdgs 
as far as myself, I'm I'm trying to enjoy life. Um, and so, um, yeah, I stopped running Stakeholder Forum in 2012. Um, and I have a number, a small number of projects with the university, which I'm enjoying doing. And then if there's a particular interest that I have and there's a funder that wants to fund me to do it, I'll, I'll do it. So I had uh, Aviva, which is a big finance company, fund the work around the GA resolution on sustainable investment. We now have an annual resolution that can start to really ratchet up the pressure on the finance sector, which we didn't have before. I have uh, World Animal Protection uh, have taken me on to try and get a universal declaration on animal welfare. So we actually are doing a webinar with member states uh, in December on that. And so we'll hopefully next year or the year after get a resolution on that. Um, and then I use the books to try and get um, people to think about things. So the stakeholder democracy one was done because of the destructive, partly because of the destructive impact of the civil society discourse that was ha having its impact and I wanted people to understand the arc of democracy and where we fitted in it and it was bigger than just individual organizations or different things and the same with the 2030 one and with the profiles in courage I'm trying to kind of add some interest things to make the process you'll find my, my books fill, fall into different categories so you'll find ones which are to tell you about a process and to hopefully by doing that help you to understand it better some of them are training some of them are ones of position statements in a sense so before you end summits i'll i'll produce a set of uh, of um chapters by different people um or they'll they'll be looking forward like uh, the 2030 the um the one on the disruptive industry and the profiles encourage fits into the explaining how the process goes and um, I, I love the idea of um, uh, of sharing what I've learned and hope that the next generation you know benefits from that we've just run uh, for UNEP a number of workshops two-day workshops four hours each work each each workshop to um, enable their uh, stakeholders to understand the process and be more effective so in your book right in the beginning there's um <clears throat> And this is kind of what what I realized with, with a lot of people that I speak to about the sustainable development goals and about things in general. You have a, a list of, of acronyms. So thank goodness uh, today you haven't <laughs> used, you haven't used too many acronyms and abbreviations in our discussion. But the UNEP is the United Nations Environmental Program, and um, people who aren't uh, at ease with diplomatic or, or, or democracy or UN international organizations speak. Um, this book is really wonderful. It's easy to digest, uh, negotiating the sustainable development goals. And um, uh, there's a lot of things to learn. And it's a nice view behind the scenes. It's a nice view to see how that occurs. And, and the reason, and I'll go back to it again, and I mentioned it early, the reason it's a historical precedence, the reason it's the world's first ever global moonshot is exactly what's described in the book. This is so complex. Can you imagine how many meetings, how many countries, how many delegates, how many negotiators, how many people came together that they were able to agree on anything is like a miracle. If you don't believe in God, you must believe in it now because I'll tell you what, <laughs> that is a historical precedence. It's hard enough for two countries to come together and decide where they're gonna go to lunch, let alone on a roadmap for our future through intensive discussions and negotiations. And if you understand that and you see that big picture, then you can have a little more respect for it. You can understand who it's for and that it's not just a bunch of crazies that are trying to, 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 to tell you some weird story. It's actually, uh, it's like a navigation. It's like a map to, to get us to a better future. And it's also just a better business model when you think about it. And, it, and that's also what I liked when you mentioned that when you begun this uh, whole uh, discussions you kind of touched on how the millennium development goals were really lacking in some areas and that they didn't take us to exactly where we needed to go 
the SDGs are not like that at all. They are a complete system, a great plan, great structure. And so, um, and that's really what I want to, to let people know. And I want to educate them how that they're not for cities and corporations and big governments. Therefore, each and every one of us, we can all apply them. We can all use them. Uh, I, I like the story. You said your daughter was in Indonesia on the train and she saw, you know, on the SDGs playing in the Philippines with uh, uh, Senator Alvarez, one of the oldest uh, members of the UN. You know, he was one of the first cops ever. He passed away because of COVID during, during this pandemic this year. It's sad right. to see him go. But with him, we created the SDG soap operas for the Philippines to break down indigenous cultures to indigenous people yeah. and who don't speak English who, to, to, in their own language with music in a fun, entertaining way to understand the SDGs and how to apply them to, to their lives. And uh, with Hindu Ibrahim, we're doing the same thing with, they, they don't, people of Chad don't, are, are, are patriarchal community. They don't understand colors or the SDGs, but there's a way they can understand them if we just talk to them normal and tell them and explain how the world works and the complexity in that there is a plan and a roadmap. And then their eyes light up and then they say, oh yeah, great, we've got, We've got something to hold on to. There's what the future is. And it's that story or narrative that if you really look to December 2030, if we reach and meet all the goals, the targets, the indicators, we get on that path, it creates this beautiful story, this, this desirable future that very few would say, oh, I don't want to live in that. Beautiful. I, I'm, I'm happy with you know, uh, business as usual where we are, I think the majority of people say, boy, that's a bright future. That's something positive to look forward to. And I, and it really is. So I, I'm so thankful to have you here. And, and I don't know if you have anything to say to that, but I have uh, three more questions before we go. Okay, just just a couple of things. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a thing called PCI Media. Um, which run Comics Uniting Nations. Uh, and they do it with the world's largest classroom. Great resources. And I would definitely recommend my comic. I did it. It's called Santa's Green Christmas. And it's a humorous look at climate change uh, and how Santa finds out about it reading the, uh, the IPCC report. So, and for those comic connoisseurs, they'll find a couple of Easter eggs about Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. For those who aren't, it's a little bit more of a Shrek set sense of humor. But I think that those are useful resources for for kids to download um, and use, they're free. Uh, the UN system has completely reorganized around the SDGs. I cannot underline how important role uh, Amina Mohammed has played in doing that. If you go to the UN uh, Outer Space Commission this month, they're having their SDG conference uh, on how SDGs fit into outer space. So it, the whole system has reorganized around uh, the SDG. So there's a, a huge change that's going and sometimes these bureaucracies take a little longer uh, than, and that's why the comics are there. So you can read them during that, uh, that, that timeline. That, that's beautiful. And I did see that. I didn't mention it in your bio, but there was a lot that I missed, but I will put your links and those things in the show notes so that people can go out and look and, and, and discover more about you because it really is about breaking it down for each individual, uh, reeking and picking them up where they're at to, to explain you know, what it does mean. We have, uh, we're, we both like cartoons, comics, uh, animations, things like that. We like superheroes and, and, and this Star Trek type of a future, you know, a different world, but um, Really, what we're lacking today, even projecting the future, is media or stories that are non-dystopian, that don't show us fighting over water or resources or, you know, these uh, total recall or whatever these dystopian futures out there. We're lacking media with positive, uplifting stories that show us this bright future of what it would mean or what it would look like if we did achieve the sustainable development goals. And so right now, boring old Mark will tell you the story about the SDGs or Felix will tell you, but we don't have big movie magic and can't show you these beautiful visions of what that will really look like to reach and achieve it. I would really hope that, that we eventually get to that point where we can create 
TV series and media that, that depict that beautiful, resilient, desirable futures once we reach the sustainable development goal, so we can even see what that would look and feel like, even if it's movie magic, so that we can start to engineer and create that. For my guests, I have three sustainable takeaways that I want to steal from you, Felix. I want you to give them a free gift of your knowledge and your wisdom um, that, that they can say, boy, boy, uh, that's a takeaway that I can use, apply in my life or something that's made me better. And um, really, uh, first of all, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners, a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would that be? What's, what's your message? I, I think uh, you have to be hopeful. Um, and that if you apply positive thinking to your life uh, and the, the, the idea of living more sustainably, you'll find that there are now lots of ways of doing that. Um, maybe more in developed countries as far as technology is concerned, but in developing countries often uh, they already are doing that uh, in the poorest communities. Uh, Hindu is a good example of, uh, of how she's living her life. Uh, so I think my attitude is always be positive, always believe that you can, uh, you can change things yourself. Uh, and I did a book about my time in the Liberal Party, which was really humorous looks at my failures and successes. But ultimately, ultimately, it's a story of how, you know, in a sense, young people can play such a critical role. There was Seven Suzuki in 92, who was the equivalent of Greta now. They played critical roles in giving us the visions that, uh, you know, challenging our, our preconceptions and that the idea that young people now have a much stronger platform uh, in our discussions, I think is, has been a real success. Exactly, and I, I, I remember Severin very well, and she's, uh, she was just on this last, um, there was a big online event from the UN as well. She was just kind of gave us an update. I think she's like 42 years, still going strong, still active. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was very nice. Um, what should um, young innovators in your field be thinking about or looking ways to make real impact? What are things that maybe they should be looking towards thinking about to make real impacts on our world? So I, I think there are, there are different answers to that. And so in the context of the, the innovators themselves, I think, um, you know, you have the most um, entrepreneur youngest generation that we've ever had. They're, they're very much about doing things themselves. They have access to, to technology that we didn't have. And so I think they have a great opportunity to look at these new technologies that are coming up and look at their impact on, uh, <clears throat> on the environment and what they can do to try and, um, try and reduce it. I mean, so small example on, uh, on travel, you know, with virtual reality in the next 10 years, you don't actually have to go to that place. You can experience it at home. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to the place, but I'm saying you will be able to have so many more experiences. You could be sitting in the cell that Nelson Mandela sat in for, what, 36 or 37 years and, and experience what it's like to be there. You could be standing next to Martin Luther King um, during some of the demonstrations because those things will be possible by 2030. And it were, you could be the young person who helps to address racism addresses inequality by making these kinds of tools that make it more likely that people uh, will understand it. The second thing is you can change things. And as young people, you know, a small example from the negotiations, we had tried, it was actually the, uh, the uh, World Animal Protection who had tried to get some text in, in 2014 on uh, antibiotic resistance. It was clear from the WHO uh, re review that they had done that we're looking at 100 million deaths potentially by 2030 because we're becoming antibiotic resistant. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get WHO to come to the negotiations because Ebola was happening. And so there was no opportunity. There was then a couple of reports, one by Obama, one by Cameron, which highlighted it before the 20, the 20 uh, 30 uh, into the governmental negotiations in 15. Um, we weren't able to get it in there. It was the last we're at the end of the, the penultimate week. I'm in the coffee bar and one of the youth delegates, Asher, comes up to me and he goes, let's have another go. And I, of course, I told him to get lost. I mean, as you do, you know, it's five, it's six o'clock and it's like, you know, the, the last but one, uh, 
the last bit one week. And he just hassled me. I mean, just really. I mean, I, yeah, I could have, you know, whatever. So we go in. I, I speak to the Americans. He speaks to the Europeans. By Monday, the text is in. And so that, that energy, that young people don't give up. Don't feel that, that's, um, that it's, it, it's not possible. It is possible. You can change the world. And young people have been at the forefront of all changes. The third thing is join a political party. The huge mistake that, that my generation made was we only went into NGOs or wherever we went. And we left political parties bereft of that intelligence. And then you end up where we have ended up in the political world with parties that do not have great leadership and do not have the right people because the young people of my generation thought it was easier to win on one issue as opposed to be involved in the political party system. You have to get engaged in a political party system. We need those new leaders there as well. Yeah, there's, so you mentioned also Severin Suzuki and Greta, but there's another uh, great youth uh, who's not youth anymore, Felix Finkbeiner, Finkbeiner yeah. he carries the same name, the first name as you, and uh, plant for the planet, stop talking, start planning, He's trained 86,000 climate leaders, planted 500 million trees, something like that. Unbelievable what he's done. So I, I totally agree. There are wonderful things that youth can do and that uh, um, to even set an example for us. And the last question I have for you is, what have you experienced or learned in your journey so far to today that you wish you would have known from the start? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think, um, I think I, I built my, my involvement in the UN uh, on my experiences in political parties. And I think that was uh, the correct way of doing it. I understood the systems. I understood politics. I understood politicians. Too many people, I think, come from just having done a degree in geography or environmental science and don't understand how politics works and then arrive at the UN or at their national government and don't understand how, why people can't take up what are clearly very good ideas. So um, I'm not sure that it's a common. What I will tell you is a story about how I got involved in green politics, which was that I had come back from Sudan and the state of the youth wing of the Liberal Party was not very good. And so I decided to take it over. And so I invited some of my uh, friends from the uh, from university who'd been in the Liberal Club. Um, and my wife's sister invited her geography friends. I really regret that. And so, we, so I argued, this was 1981, 82, I argued that we should do anti-apartheid and anti-racism because that's where the issues, the young Liberals had built a, uh, a reputation on <coughs> in the UK. And all these geography students voted for green issues. Uh, so I lost the vote. Um, and um, within a year, we had a majority on the youth executive, the national youth executive. Within three years, I was the national chair on a green ticket. So, you know, I, I think that's slightly different than what should I have done. I mean, if I'd lost, if, if I'd won that vote, my trajectory would have taken a completely different, uh, a different direction. Thank you so much, Felix. And, and if there's not anything else you'd like to share with us or questions you'd like to ask me, I'm done. And I really appreciate your time. I hope we can have a follow up when your book comes out next year. Um, again, do another podcast to talk about your book and, and uh, kind of get a catch up to see how we've all been. And I hope our paths cross again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye -bye. You too. Thank you.